attempt at characterization for David. Big things have small beginnings. Speaking of abortion, Dr. Shaw's pregnancy occurs without consequence in this film. Why not acknowledge that Shaw gave birth to a squid baby? Why not have Vickers or Wayland or David worry that it's still alive, squirming around, getting inexplicably bigger? Why isn't Vickers concerned when Yannick says, Because I'm going to inject your lysoform module onto that surface that's two years of life. Do you want it or you want to stay with me? Shouldn't she have referenced the previous scene that took place in there? Something to the effect of, you do know there's a giant face-raping octopus in that thing, right? But no, Vickers' only reaction is this. If fans rise to the fence claiming she didn't know about it, then that simply raises further questions about why David wanted the embryo in the first place. I don't think that's a good idea. While it is perhaps refreshing that the film chose not to retread the familiar ground of the Alien franchise and its theme of corporate greed, the fact that none of the other characters aboard a scientific vessel are at all concerned or even acknowledge the hybrid squid baby squirming around in the medical chamber is not just implausible. It's so confusing that this lapse undeniably reveals the sheer volume of script rewrites this film underwent. While I understand and even commend the impulse to avoid retreading familiar ground, the filmmakers give nothing in its place. David won't take the embryo out for reasons he never specifies, because, well... I'm afraid we don't have the personnel to perform a procedure like that. Our best option... I want it out. ...put you back into cryostasis until we return to Earth. And because neither he nor the film ever specify, nor do they follow up with the incident, it begs the question of why bother to include it. It's not as if the other characters were unaware that Shaw had an alien embryo gestating inside her. Take you back to cryo deck. Go to bed, guys. Doctor Shaw. She's totally doped. Prepare her. Or more importantly, that she removed it. Rather, David's insistence that she be put in cryostasis when it's first discovered suggests he understood that the embryo was of some considerable importance. While somewhat typical, corporate greed is nevertheless a clear and simple motivation, or could have been. For example, in the Alien franchise, Waylon Yutani's greed becomes the impetus in both Alien and Aliens. Put simply, the company wants the Alien for its bioweapons division. This film, on the other hand, presents a dizzying mix of plot themes without ever providing any payoff for these motivations. Following off from Shaw giving herself a C-section, why not have Shaw acknowledge that the reason why she had to do it herself is because David wouldn't help her? Moreover, that nobody would. Instead, she walks right into the main room where they're all standing about. I can understand that she wouldn't be thinking clearly with all the drugs she's pumping into herself right now, but the film never gives Shaw a chance to acknowledge what David just did to her, nor that she suspects he probably did it at Waylon's behest, because then, in the next scene, it's like all is forgiven by everyone, for everything. Shaw doesn't mind David basically tried to keep her sedated as a science experiment, Nobody cares that a squid baby is loose on the ship. These people don't seem to mind that Shaw whacked the crap out of them with a garbage bin. And nobody is concerned, Shaw especially, that Wayland is suddenly back from the dead. You've been asleep. You're on the ship all this time. Why? She comes off as incredibly uh, foolish and naive if she doesn't suspect that the cadre old bastard is clearly a cadre old bastard hell-bent on getting his way no matter what the collateral. Moreover, neither Waylon nor David seem concerned about the whereabouts of the fetus. There we are, sir. Nice and clean. In the original Alien, Ash, the scientist, was especially keen to examine and hang on to the corpse of the facehugger, despite Ripley's protestations. God's sake, this is the first time that we've encountered a species like this. It has to go back, all sorts of tests have to be made. Ash, are you kidding? This thing bled acid, who knows what it's gonna do when it's dead. I think it's safe to assume it isn't a zombie. I get that Scott didn't want to simply repeat the beats from Alien, but then don't include so similar an element. It comes with the territory, unfortunately. Because how could these characters possibly know the state of the Alien? 
Why wouldn't they be curious to recover it? Why wouldn't they ask Shaw about it? It's the climax. You want to keep things moving. I get it. The pace would suffer if the characters were to suddenly stop here to have a cup of tea and reminisce. Um, Miss Vickers, is there an agenda? But you can't just keep lashing plot holes together and hope they make a bridge. And yet the filmmakers still stop to introduce yet another plot free. thread. Romeo and Amor. I suppose I'd be free. You want that? Want. Not a concept I'm familiar with. That being said. Why not take a moment to resolve any of the other plot threads currently unraveling in this picture? Why not have Shaw ask what David's plan is? Why try to keep the fetus? Why does he want it? Bioweapons? Genetic research? While the answer isn't obviously vital, Shaw's lack of curiosity over why David was willing to sacrifice her for reasons unknown is curiously at odds with Shaw's constant search for answers in this movie. She wants to know about everything but that. She wants to know, for example, what David wants from Wayland, but she's not the least bit curious about why he just did what he did. I need to know why. What did we do wrong? Why do you hate us? The key questions to ask when considering whether to include any scene is what information is this scene trying to convey? And more importantly, why does this scene need to exist? If the answer to both is answerable by the same phrase, because it looks cool, then save your money and never bother shooting it. The more answers these questions provoke, the stronger the case for the scene. Next, the question becomes, does this scene accomplish its goals? Does it convey the information intended? What else might the scene suggest? And it is the duty of the filmmakers to consider and interpret the scene in countless ways. Ridley and his editors show they are capable of this approach, going so far into the minutia as to worry whether this shot would lead viewers to believe the turn of the screwdriver had caused the door to open, which says a troubling amount about the level of intelligence Scott is attributing to his audience. All your vigorous attempts to stop me from coming here, I'm just surprised to see you. So in order to better illustrate this point of asking questions about the goal of a shot or scene, consider the penultimate shot of the movie, Elizabeth blasting off into the unknown in search of answers. It is New Year's Day, the year of our Lord, 2094. My name is Elizabeth Shaw, last survivor of the Prometheus. And I'm still searching. I know why this scene is included. Get ready for a sequel! On a more serious note, the scene is intended to convey the tenacity of this character. If we, or the character, ever had any doubt of the strength of her convictions, they're resolved when she displays her tenacity to travel to the depths of a presumed hell just to find out her answers. Consider the scene that immediately follows. What is it trying to convey? That the engineer gave birth? That an alien is alive on this abandoned planet? That it bears a similarity to the alien of the original series? But the question one must also ask is, so what? What is the purpose in this movie for the scene? Let a movie never exist solely for the purpose of promoting a sequel. What is the impact of this scene on the rest of the film? It represents the completion of the life cycle for the alien. Sure, the, the payoff for the oral rape. The money shot, as it were. But that in itself does not warrant its inclusion. Certainly not when countless other scenes are left without satisfactory conclusions. Scott his editor, and more importantly his script writers, would have been well served to apply this logic to the plot of their film. They may have come up with some more worthwhile answers. This is just part one of my five part series exploring the problems of Prometheus, be sure to check back for more. Follow me on Twitter at